Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. This is the latest, the greatest edition of Nick's Nonfiction. Here with your name here. Today on the show, we have got Robert Putnam's Bowling Alone. We Bowling. That was a pretty good video game. A lot of frames per second. <laughs> PTAs, church groups, have evaporated from the fabric of society. Yeah, Robert Putnam, and what do we have? Twitter. <laughs> this is basically Boomer the Book. Yeah, they squandered the free love movement. Yeah, they gave up on the anti-war movement. Yeah, they destroyed the housing market. But boomers, they can bowl a good 10 frames. <laughs> what did the golfing boomer tell his family? Kiss my putt. <laughs> People are just lazy nowadays. Yeah, tell that to my Mexican coworker with three jobs who still can't make rent. Me and Mike and Linda are going to have caviar down at the country club. I live in a box! Boomer versus Zoomer. It's going to be fun. What really piqued my interest here, Putnam mentions previous Nick's nonfiction authors. Quote, C. Wright Mills and Betty Friedan have identified a central crisis at the heart of our society and suggest what we can do. C. Wright Mills, that was a Patreon ep. The Power Elite. <laughs> I don't care about no Boomazuma. I care about the Metropolitan 300. We'll weave all that bullshit in today. And Betty Friedan, she was a real feminist, not one of these one-eyed, one-horned, purple-haired people eaters. <laughs> We're on a roll. Quote, One of the central arguments of this book is that both civic engagement and organizational involvement experienced market decline during the second half of the 20th century. According to the best available evidence, these declines have continued uninterrupted. Since the turn of the 21st century, fewer and fewer Americans are socializing through membership organizations. We know. Get an Xbox and stop complaining. This whole book of Robert Putnam's telling you to touch grass. It's all true. We all know in 10 years that nobody's going to interface with other human beings. Hey Alexa, is it okay if I wipe my butt? <laughs> Hey Siri, am I allowed to breathe today? Or am I over my carbon credits? It's gonna happen. I told my friend I just landed a job in a bowling alley. Tenpin, he asked. No, it's permanent. <laughs> Ten pin? Never go bowling with a mathematician. They always find X. What's the difference between your wife and a bowling ball? I can only get three fingers in the bowling ball. <laughs> We'll be right back. About the author Robert Putnam, born 1941, he's an American political scientist specializing in comparative politics. This guy's 82 years old, and he's still teaching at Harvard. Public policy. Me. Community outreach? No thanks. I'd rather outreach my hand to scratch my balls. Robert was a team bowling champion, and then he got his hand chopped off kingpin style Woody Harrelson. Another one. He became the dude and started bowling and got involved in the... Why are there so many uh, movies about bowling? I've done stand-up in a bowling alley. You know, some of my jokes struck out. I split the audience. What did the bowling ball who was taken hostage say? Please, spare me. <laughs> What's the difference between a prostitute and a bowling ball? I don't have a freezer full of bowling balls in my apartment. Be right back.
Robert Putnam, Bowling Alone, Chapter 1, Blame Game. Quote, No one is left from the Glen Valley, Pennsylvania Bridge Club who can tell us precisely when or why the group broke up. Even though its 40-odd members were still playing regularly as recently as the 90s, just as they had done more than half a century. The shock in the Little Rock, Arkansas, Satoma Club, however, was still painful. In the mid-1980s, nearly 50 people had attended the weekly luncheon to plan activities to help the hearing and speech impaired, but a decade later, only seven regulars continued to show up. The Roanoke, Virginia chapter of the National Association of the Advancement of Colored People had been an active force for the NAACP, and their numbers withered from 2,500 to a few hundred. So he gives 10 more of these cases. People aren't joining groups anymore. Somehow in the last several decades of the 20th century, all these community groups and tens of thousands like them across America begin to fade. And it wasn't much that old members dropped out, but the community organizations were no longer continuously revitalized as they had been in past years by fresh new members. Organizational leaders are flummoxed. For years, they assume that their problem must have been local roots or at least that it was peculiar to the organization, so they commissioned dozens of studies to recommend reforms. Hmm, studies. Nobody's having fun anymore, so maybe studies will fix that. Group exercises. Make alcohol cheaper or I will steal it. <laughs> I don't know, are people having fun at these things and shit? Like, we all have fucking three jobs. Who has time to go bowling? But studies will fix it. <laughs> I don't think anybody in a fucking lab coat is going to expose this meta-conscious problem we're talking about. And you see how the author just frames it in, there's no new members, so it's young people's problem. But it's a, it's a bigger phenomena is what I'm getting at. I'm thinking about how in Japan they're paying men to have sex with women. Like, when a generation decides it's done, it's a sudden collapse. You got Jordan Peterson and all these motherfuckers talking about how nobody's having kids. It's not talked about. I don't think it's Boomer versus Zoomer here. There is a collapse of the population who cares about Bridge Club. <laughs> <laughs> if we want to indulge it a little, Boomers gave us a shit system and are mad that we're not fighting to protect it. Why aren't you involved in the zoning board? It's all corrupt. <laughs> Bro, we had a mayor, and I went to a summer camp. It cost like $200, and you could dump your kid off there every day. For some reason, the mayor's son started to come, and he would show up with a lacrosse stick. And we're like, what do you... We don't play lacrosse here. Go back to lacrosse camp. And <laughs> he was like, my dad is building a pool. We're like, on a mayor's salary, he's building a pool? I don't know. <laughs> all I'm saying... Nobody's right. We're all being played like a game of bowling. <laughs> Quote, in the 1960s, in fact, community groups across America had seemed to stand on the threshold of a new era of expanded involvement. Except for the civic drought included by the Great Depression, their activity had shot up year after year. Cultivated by a city of civic garters and watered by increasing affluence and education, each annual report registered rising members. This guy is a little wordy. Churches and synagogues were packed as more Americans worshipped together than only a few decades earlier, perhaps more than ever in American history. So, like, from the 20s to the 90s, it was growing. And I don't know how we get it back, the growth where people want to be around people again. Russia, China, if you're listening, hit us with the EMP. We need it. <laughs> <clears throat> Jokes. We need a war, though. You hear boomers say this all the time. These kids, they'll stop talking about their pronouns when they get drafted. Well, if they reinstate the draft, I hate to announce it, but I'm trans. I'm not going to war. <laughs> uh, it is a, a degree of hardship, I guess, that brings community back together. But we're already in a great fucking depression. We don't need a war. Motherfuckers have three jobs out here. I'm going to keep saying that the whole episode, okay? <laughs> Like, seriously, there's no time to go bowling. <laughs> Bigger point. War brings people together. We have a shared enemy. He's talking about all this bullshit. He took a while to talk about race here, so if you're hung up on that. He says, the 50s were no place for a black man. In the 50s, I don't know, black men would set up targets at shooting ranges while people were firing. 
I stuttered. Nowadays, you put a black guy at the golfing range and you have to try to hit him. <laughs> he made another unnecessary caveat. Not all groups are good. The power elite, he's bringing back up C. Wright Mills. One of his big examples were NIMBY, not in my backyard. And then, uh, like, the governatorial boards were able to infiltrate the local boards. And so I'm just thinking about Black Lives Matter, because that's more recent. The admins bought million-dollar beachside properties. Another one. I was at the fucking George Floyd protests. I don't know. The next chapter is about politics. He had a good one about Florida. They were holding out on federal funding for their highways. And then the KKK started adopting highways. <laughs> <laughs> so the government can't build the roads. But the racists. Who will build the roads, libertarians? Racists will. <laughs> <laughs> The only point I'm going to make for the chapter, that's what he talked about. I think the only difference between boomers and zoomers, social capital is not really a thing anymore. Nobody knows their neighbor. <laughs> like, you felt cool as a boomer because your neighbor saw you go bowling on Friday night. And I guess I'm wrong because all these hipsters, they just want to be seen out. But the bigger point, your group is going to get infiltrated. It's probably better to have a human look at you and appreciate you than some stranger on the internet to call you based. <laughs> but again, we should probably build real communities. What game do you want to play? Fake websites or fake community? Neither generation had the balls to cut ties and stop playing games. <laughs> Chapter 2, Political Participation. This is going to be a quick one. Started listing rising trends in agoraphobia. And then he's saying it follows that people give up on the political system because we don't even have community. Hmm, so logical. There's fucking furries, Robert. <laughs> Agoraphobics. Yeah, if I see a furry in the street, I'm going to hunt it and bring the meat home. Oh, they didn't have a safety vest on, officer. I thought it was wild game. <laughs> Hunting furries. Everybody's getting, like, radicalized with these weird kinks, so there's so much shame out there. No fucking wonder. Two-thirds of people in this country cannot maintain a healthy weight. You think we're going to maintain a healthy democracy? <laughs> Enough. It's over. <laughs> Quote, we begin with the... I, and I'm not really black-pilled people. I think we could start again. Maybe we'll get there at the end. We begin with the most common act of democratic citizen voting. In the 1960s, 62.8% of voting age Americans went to the polls to choose between John F. Kennedy and Richard Nixon. In 1996, after decades of slipping, 48.9% of voting age Americans chose Bill Clinton. Participation in presidential election has declined by roughly a quarter over the last 36 years. So the only thing that's important about this quote, voter turnout keeps decreasing. It's not cool anymore to post on Instagram, I voted. And, yeah, he's trying to say that Kennedy's the good guy at the beginning of that quote. He's a fucking mobster. And maybe he was a mobster up against, like, Satanists. I'm not trusting that. <laughs> Whatever. Like, the only fucking presidential election I voted in was Gary Johnson my first time. And then when I moved to Colorado, I wanted to join the Libertarian Party. It's based out of Littleton. Might sound a little dick, but I'm kind of happy I didn't waste my time there. To anybody who's into politics, I really hope you can inflict change, but... <laughs> kind of feels like a LARP to most of Zoomers at this point. You just dress up as a trans cat girl, lib right one day, and then the next day you're a communist. And then the day after that, you got green hair. Everybody's just trying out political parties. It doesn't matter. <laughs> And he said before, boomers want to be seen out. They want to be seen waving their flag. <laughs> like, the only Zoomers that have the Trump flags are the ones that are on the beach who have Jeeps that their parents paid for. You know what I'm saying? How long do you hold on to your parents' politics? Quote, the next sort of social change is slower, more subtle, and harder to reverse. 
If different generations have different tastes or habits, the social physiology of birth and death will eventually transform society, even if no individual ever changes. Even if no individual changes, the cycle of all these people is going to change. Much of the change in sexual mores over the last several decades have been of this sort. Relatively few adults change their views about morality, and most of those who did actually became more conservative. In the aggregate, however, American attitudes toward premarital sex, for example, have been radically liberalized over the last several decades, because a generation with stricter beliefs was gradually replaced by a later generation with more relaxed norms. That's a fancy way to say that my generation are the pioneers of eating ass. Bro, I've eaten a buffet of ass in my lifetime. Like, millennials were probably looked at weird by boomers because they did it doggy style. <laughs> it just gets freakier and freakier. That quote was pretty dope up top, though. <laughs> it's like social engineering is pretty easy because one generation after another... I can't even relate to somebody five years younger than me because they're gooning off to fenboys. <laughs> Femboy? I don't even know how to say it, but... <laughs> that shit is gross, but like... Kids that are 10 years younger than me, I don't even know anymore. Bro, I'm fly. No cap, but I'm straight bussin'. What the fuck? <laughs> Quote, Today's generation gap in political knowledge does not reflect some permanent tendency for the young to be less well-informed than elders, but is instead a recent development. <laughs> There's no excuse. We have so much more information. I don't know. We're using Snapchat and TikTok to get socially engineered. From the earliest opinion polls in 1940 to the mid-1970s, younger people were at least as well-informed as their elders. But it is no longer the case. Shut up, bro. So I'm saying you really are getting... And me too is the point of this rant. It's called audience capture. I've been looking into it. And it's a, a point from a Mesmer book too. It's like you got to hypnotize your audience and that's how you lead. It's a stand-up thing. But on YouTube, it's the exact... Uh, the audience hypnotizes the creator. So you know that kid Nick Akato? He was like a gay 18-year-old violinist and he was doing vlogs in his bedroom. And then he did a mukbang. And then the only thing his audience wanted to see was mukbang. So you got to keep feeding the beast. The Mr. Beast. We are getting fingered by the social algorithm. We are not more powerful, myself included. This news and information gap affecting not just politics, but even things like airline crashes, terrorism. Shut up. <laughs> what he's saying is right. Every day all of us wake up with a pit in our stomach. What's it going to be today? UFOs, nuclear disaster, a Tonganese earthquake. It's a fucking clown show every day. People are going to start losing it. Like, we don't know how this ages is what I'm saying. I remember there was a Washington Post headline. It was like a couple years ago. <laughs> Protesting is unconstitutional. So, you know, the First Amendment of the Constitution, the right to assemble, protesting, it's unconstitutional. Like, if you look at the news, <laughs> they break your psyche on purpose. Protesting is unconstitutional. It's doublespeak. I don't know what to tell you guys. <laughs> protesting is un. In Canada, they'll just seize your bank account. So, protesting is illegal. That's what they're trying to say. Politics. You can't fucking hold a sign anymore. The George Floyd protest. That's what I was alluding to. That's probably the height of my political involvement. <laughs> Unless I do a freak third party candidate run for president in the future. No, son. Like, did we accomplish anything with that protest? No. But is it good morale to see people screaming in the face of a line of arm... Gu yeah, it's kind of cool. I think I saw a real-life Fed in action there. To take the story a level deeper, maybe I'm paranoid, but there was this 
dime of a light-skinned girl, and she was leading the march. Like, she knew all these, the people united will never be divided. She knew all these chants and bullshit. We made eye contact a few times. A little bit of sexual tension. But I had this Gadsden flag, so I think she was trying to suss out if I was an op as well. Later that night, I see this girl on the news. I invited this chick, Caitlin, to my room. To, I was like, I saw her at the protest, and we were talking about it. I remember this. How the fuck do you get on the news after a protest? They don't take you onto the side of the cops and then put a camera in front of your face. Like, it was at night. She was in the studio. This was a fucking glowy at the BLM rally. <laughs> guys want to listen to fucking Alex Chavez or whatever that guy's name is, chirp at AOC? I saw a Fed in action. If Antifa and BLM, all of these things can be controlled, like as grassroots as that is, political parties? That shit is captured. Chapter 3, Religious Participation. Churches and other religious organizations have a unique importance in American civil society. America is one of the most religiously observant countries in the contemporary world, with the exception of a few agrarian states such as Ireland and Poland. The United States has been the most God-loving and religious-adhering, fundamentalist and religiously traditional country in Christdom. Now he's talking based. And like all the girls shaking their ass on the internet, you think that we're not religious? Europe? Those people are godless. <laughs> the most religiously fecund country where more new religious have been born than in any other society is America. It's kind of true, bro. You don't like to look at this side of society? Like when you drive through West Colorado, I'm doing this to say everybody's religious, but... Dude, you can see Denver glowing in the distance from hundreds of miles. Like, you're inside the orb of the city, and you don't even think about the majority of the world. We're just fucking a country full of people who drink beer and watch NASCAR. 500 miles in a circle? Yeah! Inside every American's heart, a neck-and-neck -neck race between NASCAR and God. So, America, are we religious? I don't know. I'm just saying the French, they might get smitten in the afterlife. Smote. Smited. But, um, I guess they come on the canvas of life more than we do. <laughs> Monet, Manet, Matisse. I don't give a fuck. Americans, we got God on our side. We still make good art. So the point is that maybe... You do make better art when you have God on your side. Like, we all have this Stephen King, Hunter S. Thompson, the fucked up artist. That's where all the best stuff comes from. I don't fucking know, dude. Michelangelo, these monks are making some dope work. Although, most often we think of the colonists as a deeply religious people, one systematic study of the history of religious observance in America estimates that a rate of formal religious adherence grew steadily from 17% in 1776 to 62% in 1980. I'm not sure if I believe that, but... Who the fuck did that study? The Pony Express? 17% of people are religious in 1776. I highly doubt <laughs> that people who risked their life sailing across an ocean on a wooden ship were less religious. Yo, that just doesn't make sense. He's saying that the they were Puritans that came here. I don't know. Other observers such as E. Brooks Hollyfield argue that the meaning of church membership has become less stringent over time and conclude that from the 17th century through the 20th, participation in congregation has probably remained relatively constant. For the past 300 years, 35 to more fucking percentages. So like my grandma, she's tried and true Booma. She went to this like hoity-toity church, you know, she's wanting to be seen. But then when she was getting older, older, she just started to go to a church that was like Baptist rhythm and music. <laughs> Like, I don't know. Closer you get into the truth, 
in either case, one reason for the resilience in religion, unlike in other Western nations, has been pluralistic and constantly evolving, expressed in a kaleidoscopic series of revivals and awakenings, rather than a single state religion that could become ossified. So, uh, I would say that Americans are more spiritual than they are religious. That's all he's kind of getting at. This quote is looking better. Faith communities in which people worship together are arguably the single most important repository of social capital in America. The church is people, says Reverend Craig McMullen, the activist pro-pastor of Dorchester Temple Baptist Church in Boston. It's not a building. It's not an institution even. It's a relationship between one person and the next. Or as Thor said, Asgard is not a place. It's a people. (laughs) Who said it first, Marvel or the priest? I got one more quote on the chapter. As a rough rule of thumb, our evidence shows nearly half of all associational memberships in America are church-related. Half of all personal philanthropy and religious in character have all volunteering occurred in religious context. So how involved we are in religion today matters a lot for American social capital. All I'm saying is Zoomers don't care about social capital. He's barking up the wrong tree. Make free wine at church. Spirituality for like fucking Native Americans. Those people just did drugs together around a fire. Maybe the French are onto something. I live in Spain without the S. Chapter 4. Workplace. What's it called when baristas try to unionize? Grounds. For termination. Workplace, you guys know I put my post-college years in that Starbucks. Well, I mean, that was after the bank, but I keep up with the drama. There's this Project Veritas whistleblower, and he got Howard Schultz on a hot mic saying the point of diversity in the workplace is so that the workers won't unionize. Grounds for termination. (laughs) Robert's whole point for the chapter We're poor because nobody wants to work. This is one of my favorite philosophical memes floating around. It's the trolley test. So you got two tracks, one guy standing at the lever. His thought bubble says, I should really stop this train, but at some point, people might thank me and I might have to make small talk. (laughs) It's the most Zoomer meme ever. (laughs) I like this one better. The train is coming down the tracks. A man is standing at the switcher. Currently, the train will hit nobody. You can give the man at the lever $5, and the train will go down the track and destroy a cow. Will you give him the $5? That's a more honest trolley track question. Grounds for termination? A buddy of mine worked at a construction site, and he had this story where his boss made a rule. And it was like, if you're a minute late, then he docks you for the first 15 minutes of pay. So my homie was the first guy to go in at 9.15. <laughs> He's like, I can't control traffic. I'd rather snooze on my alarm or just drink coffee in my truck. And then the whole crew started doing the same thing. So the boss couldn't say anything because, you know, it was his big dick flex initially. He's just don't show up for 15 minutes if you're not going to work. So then the big boss gets involved and he chewed out my buddy's boss. And he was like, how come we're losing a week's worth of work every single month? (laughs) And it was all because he told him, don't come in one minute late. And it's like the mid-manager brain, they don't understand the balance. It's a fucking ecosystem. There's going to be a couple people who leech off company time. But if you try to make these harder rules... I don't know, man. Workplace bullshit? It's boring. I'm getting sad. (laughs) Robert was saying in academia, they separate the teachers with the tenure system. So, yeah, you're bribed with the ability to be lazy so that you don't ask for more money in the future. (laughs) It's like the most anti-capitalistic thing. You get to be the worst possible version of yourself. You get it. My fucking religion is education, basically. It should be an incentive to work harder and harder for no reason. He quoted John D. Rockefeller, Moreover, when at work, 
Our time is our employer's, not our own. <laughs> we are paid to work, not to build social capital, and our employer has the legal right to draw the line between the two. The whole fucking chapter was like corporate tease, fucking cringe talk. In short, some features of the contemporary American work life, more time at work, more emphasis on teamwork, would seem to foster informal workplace social capital, while other features downsizing the fray out of ties to a particular firm, the rising contingent work post in the opposite direction. This guy is <laughs> bidding for more time at work. Boomers are in love with work from home. This entire chapter is shot. We're all the same. People want to stay at home and be with their cats. Chapter 5, Social Connections. So this one is less formal. We're still talking about bowling, right? What do you call a bowling ball that falls from the sky and knocks down all the pins? An airstrike. <laughs> we were getting a little metaphysical in the beginning. We are getting into the science of attention. They've done studies like if you watch a radioactive particle under a microscope, it takes longer to decay. So the half-life of a particle can be longer when a person observes it. So this is all the quantum realm now, the observer effect. Since nobody is observing what C. Wright Mills warned us about, the atomic particle of society is decaying. That's my analogy for the chapter. Since nobody's paying attention, of course society is going to shit. Like, if we actually cared, this thing would last longer. But nobody cares, so let's stop pretending like we care. Like Even if we built the perfect democracy tomorrow, we're way too dilapidated to make it last. I'm trying to put it nice here. We're a little bit dilettante, you know? A little too devolved, diluted. <laughs> I said it. People are obese in this country. We can't take care of ourselves, but we're going to start a global government. It's illogical. And that's the metaphysical lesson for the day. The observer effect. The more people who turn their attention to the thing, the longer it takes to decompose. I don't know how this shit works, but obviously on the political spectrum... It's rotted to the core. Drain the swamp. Robert, he taught me some Yiddish this chapter. Jewish people, they separate them into two classes. The mockers, people who make things. And then the schmoozers, people who grease the wheels. It's an odd choice of an analogy for the Jews. <laughs> A train metaphor. You know, of course, the best mockers are also schmoozers to get their machines made. So this classification isn't too helpful. He's really failing to make a stand here in the last chapter. Some early sociologists thought that the thicket of informal social conception would not survive a transplant to the anonymous city that urbanization would doom both friendship and extend kinship. So, like, are cities good for people meeting each other? Or does everybody hide in their apartment? However, experience showed that even in the most densely populated urban settings, social filaments linking residents were steadily regenerated. So, whether you're in a city or whatever, it's on the individual to make the effort. Quote, In the 1980s and the 1990s, Roper pollsters asked Americans, During the past week, how many times would you say you've gone out for entertainment, to a movie, to visit friends, to sports, to dinner, or whatever? Nearly two-thirds of us reported going out at least once in the last week, and fully half had gone to home friends for dinner uh, in the past two. Among other destinations for a night out, 4% had gone to a play or a live concert, 11% to a sporting event, 17 to a bar, uh, 18 to a movie, and around 20 to a dinner. So, that's a lot smaller than you think only a fifth of people go out. What the fuck? <laughs> it's true. They said, like, after Koofy, one-third of Denver business is closed. So, IRL is closing shop. Real life. And this is every city. I'm not just dunking on Den. Quote, 
Visits with friends are now on the social capital endangered species list. If the sharp steady declines reg registered over the past quarter century were to continue at the same pace for the next quarter century, our century-old practice of entertaining friends at home might entirely disappear from American life in less than a generation. Of course, it would be too foolhardy to predict the outcome since many things in American life will surely change over the next 25 years. But the pace of decline in social visiting over the past 25 years has been extraordinary. I don't know, man. The drop in. If someone shows up at your house without texting you first, even if it's your best friend, you're allowed to shoot them. I would suspect this person is a serial killer. <laughs> Bro, if you show at my house with a drop in, I'm going to open the door and NFL punt you in the gonads. The drop in. What are you, fucking Kramer? <laughs> Warn a motherfucker. I gotta put the crocodile away. Quote, Since the evening meal has been a communal experience in virtually all societies for a very long time, the fact that it is visibly diminished in the course of a single generation in our country is remarkable evidence of how rapidly a social connectedness has been changing. How about schmoozing at the real-life equivalent of Cheers, the neighborhood bar where everybody knows your name? That, too, is becoming a thing of the past. Three independent series of surveys from the mid-1970s to the 1990s substantiate the conclusion the frequency of which Americans both married and single went out to bars, nightclubs, discos, taverns, and the like declined by 40 to 50% over the last two decades. Whoa. A positive neighborhood watch groups have been growing. Uh, and then another one he said was growing. Alcoholics Anonymous. It's not a positive. This was a pretty cool stat. Very American. Bowlers outnumber joggers and soccer players. <laughs> His point there is that, like, the time that we used to spend playing sports with each other, now we watch sports. PTA and Greenpeace also on the decline. Yeah, I would understand Greenpeace. That doesn't sound fun. But the PTA, that was kind of a good one. My mom, she would come home with, like, tricky tray prizes, bags of cookies, gift cards. Now if you're a fucking house mom, you gamble away your kids' college funds on Raid Shadow Legends. <laughs> Shadow Wizard Money Gang. We love making hits. <laughs> Remember how boomers loved fucking Candy Crush? This is kind of true. His last big point. Cell phones have a double edge effect. It cut downs on the fallout effect, but increases time spent at home. So the theoretic solution, flip phones. And I'm just saying discipline is all we need, but... Technology could be used for open communication or propagandization. After 30 minutes of bowling talk, I guess you could say, we finally got the ball rolling. <laughs> Phones and shit. You all know what it's for. It literally has the apple of Eden on it. A bite out of the apple! <laughs> this book is me. Bowling alone. I'm the king of loneliness. <laughs> I went to my first movie alone when I was 12. I hiked 10 miles into the woods just so I could camp in peace. Bowling alone, this is not an issue. Technology is an issue. What are you even saying? Community ended in the 90s, and we've got fucking silicon as the replacement. Robert the whole time is saying, I crunched the data so I could see the future. Data doesn't mean dick. And this is coming from the book guy. We're ending on another principle. You ever heard of the uncertainty principle? Are we following along at this point? You can obtain precise amounts of information about a particle as long as you ignore its momentum. Or you could get information about its momentum as long as you ignore its exact position. Like when you focus too much on one thing, the other thing disappears. At a quantum level. Even if all of that is unobservable in your life, if you just go boomer zoomer, <laughs> you're missing the biggest picture. So he lost a bunch of author points today thinking he knows the answers to politics. 
he got one thing right. The future needs to learn from the present and from the past. That was gay. One more quote to end it. Prediction is hard, as Yogi Berra said, especially about the future. However, it will surely be... See how he's so confusing to write. He's got prepositions at the end of a ses- Preposition is before. Whether it will eventually become a powerful source of social capital or not is a question that ultimately rests at the hand of our readers, especially the younger generations. They can make the internet what they want it to be. Yeah, not if the algorithm has anything to say about it. They can make it what they want. (laughs) Not if Mr. Beast has anything to say about it. And the nation needs their energy and online know-how to craft alloys that will restore American social capital. (laughs) There it is, guys. Bowling Alone by Robert Putnam. Hope you had some fun. Got a Patreon special coming up this weekend. Definitely one of my most anticipated books. You think I went off the fucking reservation today? We're going beyond the polls on Saturday. Come along for the voyage. Get subscribed. Check out Harry Shit on Instagram. Free memes over there. Maybe go bowling this weekend. Let's get a random soundboard effect to end it. Imagine like you knock over the pins and then they rearrange themselves like a dry bones. Nick Muniz signing off. Love you guys. See you in seven short days. Peace.